Crowded dance floors, throbbing beats, pulsating strobe lights, shimmering mirror balls, polyester suits, sexy skirts, and sexier moves. The 70s were the disco decade, when every night was a celebration and DJs spun the latest disco hits until the sun came up. It was a time when dance music dominated the kingdom of pop. One woman ruled that undulating era, Gloria Gaynor, the queen of disco. Gloria was a great artist, and uh, you know, uh, every place she went, she tore the house down. She looked great, she sounded great, and she performed great every night. Gloria Gaynor's recordings of hits like Never Can Say Goodbye and Honey Bee kept dance floors hopping and helped propel disco to the forefront of the pop music scene. Never Can Say Goodbye was, you know, the first of its kind, the first album to really be mixed and engineered so that it sounded great when you played it at high volume in a nightclub. Basically, we were the originators of that whole disco sound. The blazing of that trail was really, uh, was really her. Gloria Gaynor rose to the top of the world of disco with the release of I Will Survive in 1979. It's been done in Arabic, Japanese, African, Egyptian, Spanish. Gloria recorded in Spanish. The attachment that people have to Gloria and Gloria to that song is just absolutely astounding. I Will Survive went platinum and made Gloria Gaynor a wealthy woman. In an era known for decadence and excess, she lived the lifestyle of the rich and famous. It was wonderful for us. We went to castles, palaces. I was just loving traveling, uh, loving having money and knowing how much money I had. Um, buying clothes, buying jewelry, buying gifts for family members. Family has always been the most important part of Gloria Gaynor's life. According to her younger brother, Arthur, the hardships they endured growing up in this New Jersey housing project in the 1940s brought everyone closer. This was a, essentially a one-bedroom apartment that could not have been more than, I'm going to be very generous and say 500 square feet. My sister Gloria slept by herself on the right in the single bed, and I slept in the kitchen on two chairs. Um, there were holes in the walls in some places that we would, my mother would put over with paper and paint over to make it look like the wall was complete. Whatever amount it snowed outside, we got on the living room floor. <laughs> we thought the way we lived was the way people lived all over the world. Just months before Gloria was born, her father Daniel Fowles abandoned the family leaving her mother, Queenie Mae, to raise seven children on her own. It's always difficult for a single mother, and certainly it was difficult in that day when single motherhood um, was not um, held up in esteem. Our mother was very aware of the fact that we were poor, so she tried to give her everything that she had. Even the mother doesn't realize the difficulty with raising a girl without a father because it's not until the girl is older that you realize the losses, such as a girl learns her sense of self-worth from her father. Without a strong, reassuring father figure in her life, Gloria says she had trouble adjusting and lacked self-esteem. She was very thin as a child, and kids teased her about her size. I was called uh, Skinny Minnie. I was called String Bean. I was called all of these, you know, terrible names because I was so thin. In her pain, Gloria says she turned to food for comfort. By age 12, she was overweight. The childhood taunts took a more abusive turn. I overcompensated, and the next thing I knew, they were calling me fatso, they were calling me pig. Times were painful for Gloria, and her intense insecurity from being ridiculed would haunt her for decades. Her growing love of music was her only escape. That's why, darling, 
It's incredible. As far back as I can remember, I sang with the radio. I sang with Nat King Cole. I sang with Bella Fitzgerald. Gloria's love of singing eventually paid off. Fresh out of high school, she and her brother Arthur dropped into a local nightclub to hear a popular band. Gloria was singing in her seat when she was noticed by the band leader and invited on stage. They asked if the audience would applaud for a young lady named Gloria who had this great voice. And I just recall the fact that everyone was overjoyed and wowed with the fact that of how she came off. Although, I don't think they ever noticed how terribly nervous she was. Gloria was nervous, but soon found that pleasing audiences increased her confidence and bolstered her sagging self-image. It was very, very important because I've, that was my only way of having any kind of self-esteem. I realized later on that self-esteem comes from how you feel about yourself, not from how other people feel about you. Singing made her happy, and in 1963, with encouragement from her mother, Gloria accepted an invitation from local band leader Eddie McClendon to join his group. Soon the 19-year-old singer found herself on the road and away from home for the first time in her life. It was exciting. I just wanted to travel. You know, I had no idea there was a prelude to the traveling I've been doing since. Queenie Mae was proud of her daughter. She was Gloria's closest friend and biggest supporter. My mother was 100% behind me because um, uh, she made clothes for me immediately, very quickly, beautiful um, outfits that she made for me. After seven years of touring, Gloria was achieving minor success and beginning to believe in herself. But in February of 1970, her growing confidence was derailed when she received the devastating news that her mother had become gravely ill. We talked to the doctor and he told us that she had cancer. He said that she had only half of one lung left. Half of that lung and the other lung was com were completely eaten up with cancer. And uh, so I said to her, him, um, how long does she have? And he said, uh, I don't know. On the morning of March 5th, just two weeks after Gloria received the news of her mother's illness, Queenie Mae died. I woke up suddenly in the middle of the night. I looked at the clock, it was somewhere between 5.20 and 5.30. And I knew she was gone. I knew she was gone. And then at seven something, the phone rang. I picked up the phone and it's Irma. She says, Gloria. I said, I know. I knew that she was gone. And the way that it affected Gloria and the way that it affected everybody was pretty much the same. We were all devastated, devastated. Gloria was on her own. She went back on the road, but could not escape the pain of losing her mother. It's, it's not behind me at all. The only thing different now is that I keep saying, oh, she's not there. Oh, she's gone. Because I keep wanting to buy things for her and send things to her and call her and tell her and share things with her. Still deeply affected by her mother's recent death from cancer, Gloria Gaynor went back on the road. On stage, she was good and getting better. In late 1971, music manager Jay Ellis went to hear her perform at a small New Jersey club. He came down to hear me perform, and um, he liked what he heard, and um, called me over and told me that he was a manager and that he could do great things for me. She really impressed me. I mean, I, you know, I just knew that she, you know, she could really make it out there. He could uh, get me a recording contract and he could make me a star. Of course, I was interested. After signing Gloria, Jay's first order of business was to find musicians to back her up. In early 1972, he hired a New York group called City Life to be Gloria's band. I never worked with a white band. This is an all-white band. I wondered how we were going to do, you know, because I was used to doing rhythm and blues. They were used to doing pop music. We had no... Uh... No problems with her being black, green, blue, white, and didn't matter to us. It was talent. The disco music phenomenon was on the rise in 1973, and clubs were opening all over the country. The timing was perfect when Jay Ellis landed Gloria her first record deal, and she released the upbeat dance single, Honey Bee, one of the first hits of the disco era.
Honey Bee was Gloria's first hit and put her on the map, but it left her touring band City Life bitter and angry. The record was made without them. I wanted them to record with me, but I was told that there was a, there was a deal for a singer, not for a band. You know, when you go in the studio to produce a record, you want to get it done as quickly as possible. You want to do it on the least amount of takes as possible, so you, 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 you're studio musicians. And there was nothing I could do about it. I certainly couldn't give up my opportunity. With her hit record being spun in thousands of dance clubs, Gloria was attracting a wider following. In late 1973, her manager, Jay Ellis, decided that Gloria and City Life needed to expand their act. So he added a female backing group called Simon Said, which featured sisters Sandra, Cynthia, and Tara. They had the look, they had the charisma, they had the, I mean, they can sing, I mean, they were sisters, you know, and I mean, they, they just had the whole package. Oh, I was in awe. <laughs> yeah, very excited. Because uh, they had an audition about 200 people, and we got the job. <laughs> we started working together, and um, um, we became very, very close very, very fast. One day, while sharing family snapshots with the Simon sisters, a young man caught Gloria's eye. It was their brother, Linwood, a veteran New York police officer. I spy this picture, and I say, I like him. This is the one. This is the man that I've been praying for. This is going to be my husband. Gloria was eager to meet Linwood, but it would be several months before they were introduced at his parents' home. Walked through the door, my mother introduced me to some other girl. It was kind of dark. I went upstairs, I came back down. No, I went halfway up the stairs. So halfway up the stairs, his mother says, Oh, Linwood, I, I, I want you to meet somebody. And, uh... So she beckons to me, I come out of the kitchen into the dining room and look up and she says, this is Gloria Gaynor, this is Linwood. And I said, hello Gloria, how are you? From that moment on, she belonged to me. <laughs> <laughs> A deep romance evolved from that first meeting. Gloria's love life and recording career were both taking off. I never can say goodbye. In 1975, she recorded and released her first top ten hit, Never Can Say Goodbye. We're working more now, because with this hit record, we're getting more recognition, uh, and we're getting more work, and we're making more money. And now, it's even better for me, because now I'm in love, and I've got this wonderful man who I think is my knight in shining armor. In 1976, with Linwood by her side, Gloria was honored for her unparalleled contribution to dance music. She was crowned Queen of Disco by the International Association of Disc Jockeys. When she got crowned, um, you know, it was like, um, it was like a real queen, you know what I mean? I mean it was like the, like the biggest day of our lives, it seemed at the time. But with her increasing visibility, Gloria's weight problem once again became a matter of concern. Jay Ellis was among those who told Gloria that she needed to lose weight. I mean, Gloria was, you know, she was heavy. Um, and we talked about that, and um, I kind of talked her into really thinning down. They said, I'm a star, I better try to look like one. So I went to this doctor and got on this ridiculous diet that they probably put in jail for now. Gloria was put on a dangerous liquid diet. She lost weight, but it was ruining her health. I dreamed I saw fried chickens walking around in the yard. I was starving. But now I'm getting attention from people around me. The more the spotlight shone on Gloria, the more slighted her band City Life felt. Straining their relationship even further, Gloria had gone into the studio without them yet again. Never Can Say Goodbye was recorded with studio musicians, opening old wounds with the band. And Never Can Say Goodbye was a, a product of our hard work, the groups, we arranged that song and we worked that song at, in clubs for, for many, many months. But they were not used to performing in the studio and they really didn't understand the difference. Whether we felt that we were capable of doing it, we were absolutely capable of doing it. And uh, as a matter of fact, maybe with a little bit more heart and soul than uh, the studio players put into it, in our opinion. The growing rift between Gloria and City Life was becoming too wide to bridge. In 1977, after five years of touring together, Gloria and the band split. 
It was difficult emotionally, but uh, it was like, okay, it's time. Gloria's relationship with City Life was over, and her partnership with manager Jay Ellis was turning sour. I accepted him as a friend, and I put everything into his hands, much the way I had done my mother. I didn't have a mother, I didn't have a father, he was both. And he was a friend. I put everything into his hands, and um, it just didn't work out. Trouble was brewing between the two men in Gloria's life. Linwood had Gloria questioning Jay's business practices, and Jay felt Linwood was meddling in his affairs. You know, and basically it happened. I mean, she met a, you know, a, a fella, and she fell in love. And he wanted to be her manager. And it got to, it was at the point where she was listening to him more than she was listening to me, and um, I had to talk to him to talk to her. I mean, it just got stickier and stickier, and uh, there was no way to work it out. And then we would see me signing papers without looking at them, without paying any attention to what I was doing. I would just sign whatever Jay put under my nose to sign. And then would, you know, very rightfully said to, said to me, you shouldn't do that. The break came in 1977, only a year after the top ten success of Never Can Say Goodbye. Jay agreed to let Gloria out of her contract thus ending their six-year business relationship. It was like my best friend was gone, and she wanted him to handle her career. It, it blew my mind. I mean, it, like, blew my mind. I mean. hey, darling, walk Gloria Gaynor was the undisputed queen of disco in 1977, her songs were radio and dance floor favorites. Without longtime manager Jay Ellis guiding her career, Gloria looked to her boyfriend, Linwood Simon, to manage her musical success. Everybody likes Linwood when they meet him. He's, he's, he's got such charisma. He's so straightforward and outspoken. With Linwood in control, Gloria toured relentlessly. And though she was far from home most of the year, Gloria always made time for her family, especially her younger sister, Irma. We were very close, very, very close. Um, as much as we possibly could, we were together. She came here to visit me a lot. She stayed weekends and, and sometimes longer than that. The two sisters shared a special bond. Irma was frequently by Gloria's side, traveling with her around the world. Um, she traveled with me to Indonesia, to Italy, England. We've been close ever since we were children. Surrounded by her family in Linwood, Gloria had become happy and confident, and it was showing in her performances. I'm very, very excited. I'm, I'm on top of the world um, when I'm on stage. And ladies and gentlemen, the queen of disco. Then, on March 19, 1978, disaster struck. Gloria suffered a severe injury while performing at the Beacon Theater in New York. It threatened to destroy everything she had worked so hard for. And we have this skit in the show where I'm, I'm singing and I suddenly take the, the microphone and I whip it like a whip, which makes it go back across the stage to where it originates. And the singers grab it. And we do this tug of war thing for this skit. Well, one of them grabs it and doesn't hold it. And I'm holding, expecting to be some tension on it. And so I'm pulling it, and because there's no tension on it, I fall. I fall backwards over a monitor. She couldn't move. She was screaming. Uh, I carried her to the car, drove to the hospital, and the disc had ruptured. Two days later, I wake up in my bed, paralyzed from the waist down from this fall, and I am in such agony. Gloria was confined to her hospital bed for two months. During her recovery, the fallen queen of disco turned to a higher power. I'm laying down my back with nothing to do but think, and I'm thinking, um, you know, God's been really good to me, and um, maybe the reason why this has happened to me is because I've not acknowledged him, so I get my Bible out. That's where she drew her strength from. That's where she drew her strength from. And, and it gave her time to put things in this proper perspective. Gloria's painful rehabilitation would take months. 
While she was finally preparing to leave the hospital, her record company called and asked her to listen to a song they liked. Gloria jumped at the opportunity that would eventually make her a disco superstar. They had a new president at Polydor, New York. He'd just come in from England. His name was Freddie Hyen, and he'd had a hit with a song called Substitute by a group named Clout in England. He wanted to repeat the success in the United States by having an artist here do it, and he wanted me to be that, that artist. To record Substitute, Polydor Records chose the producing and writing team of Freddie Perrin and Dino Ficaris, known for their work with Peaches and Herb. And I remembered her from uh, Never Can't Say Goodbye. I, I had no question at all. I jumped at it. It was instinctive. And uh, we got to talking, and, and I said, oh, by the way, there's a B-side. Would you like to hear the song? And uh, I put the demo on. It was I Will Survive, and she said, that's the B-side? And we were like, he's got to be joking. He's going to put this on the B-side of another record that's, that's madness because this is a hit. This is, I mean, before even hearing the music, this is a hit. This is going to be a timeless lyric that everybody's going to be able to relate to. The record company was adamant about Substitute and continued to push it to radio stations with little success. Meanwhile, Gloria, Dino, and Freddie Perrin continued their fight for I Will Survive. Then we said, okay, here's what we're going to do. You're going to put it in your show, okay? And we're going to talk to radio stations about it. Gloria found ready allies in the dance club DJs who had always been her biggest fans. Soon, I Will Survive was spinning on turntables in thousands of discotheques all over the country, filling dance floors, and causing a sensation that spilled out of the clubs and onto the pop charts. I Will Survive was number one in five different countries at one time, and it was number one at one time or another in probably 80 or more countries. Though I Will Survive and the album Love Tracks both reached platinum status, the impact of I Will Survive could not be measured in record sales alone. The song had a unique effect on people's lives then, as it still does today. Every time I hear your song, I think of you, and I do survive. I did survive, thank God, for that honor. Songwriter Dino Ficaris remembers a grateful woman's story about the song. She said, you know, that song saved my life. I was, uh, I was contemplating suicide, and I was sitting in my car. And all I had was a tape version of I Will Survive, and I kept playing it over and over again. I must have played it over a hundred times. And um, it's, because of the, it's because of that song that I didn't commit suicide. And I want to thank you. I Will Survive made Gloria Gaynor a full-fledged star. And by 1979, her career was in full gear. Her only unfulfilled dream was to marry Linwood. I proposed to him about five or six times before he, one night, I'm asleep, and the phone rings, and he says, let's get married. And I go, okay. In the morning, very sleepily, I hang up the phone. And all of a sudden, I jump up. I go, what? What happened? So I dialed his number. I said, did you call me? He said, yes. Did you ask me to marry you? He said, yes. Did I say yes? He said, yes. I said, OK. I hung up. <laughs> and the next morning, I was like, at last, this is going to happen. On October 9, 1979, Gloria Gaynor and Linwood Simon were married. Money was pouring in from the success of Gloria's chart-topping disco anthem, I Will Survive. And the couple was living a fantasy life. Yet according to Gloria, her problems with low self-esteem persisted. Though she wore the crown of disco queen, she never felt truly accepted by the ultra-trendy crowd that surrounded her. There was still this insecurity, and I felt that the only reason why they accepted me was because I was a disco queen. Gloria says she started using cocaine to fit in with the disco crowd even though drug use conflicted with her growing faith, which had been building since her accident. And cocaine made me feel like I was being pushed faster than I wanted to go, and I absolutely hated it. But it was the only way that I could stay up. 
and I didn't want to be left out. I never wanted to be left out because to me this was rejection. And I couldn't stand it. I couldn't, I couldn't deal with it. I, it, it, it. It made my self-esteem even lower. The conflicts in Gloria's life were too strong. Something had to give. I, I felt there was no there was no honesty there and I could not just be blatantly dishonest in the face of God so I couldn't do it anymore coming up next the perfect marriage crumbles I was coming down on him I was condemning him I no longer wanted these things that he wanted I no longer wanted to do the things that we both had so much fun doing and later Gloria Gaynor's family is shattered by a brutal murder it was an unbelievable loss. Unbelievable loss. Come out of faith. I just walked in to find you here with that bad look upon your face. The huge worldwide success of I Will Survive turned Gloria Gaynor's life into a glorious party. But by 1982, disco music was fading in popularity, and Gloria was getting tired of the party her life had become. And I'm learning that the only thing God says is wrong it's what is detrimental to you, to someone else, or to the wonderful planet that he's given us to live on. That's the only thing he considers wrong. And there, in that, I'm able to find strength to live in the way that I know how to live. I learned who I am. Realizing she could no longer reconcile her faith with the decadent disco lifestyle, Gloria began distancing herself from the dance club crowd and became more involved with her church. And all the things that are out there just doesn't fill that void. And she started reading the Bible and stumbled upon some truths. At the close of 1982, Gloria Gaynor made a dramatic change in her life. Seeking heavenly guidance, Gloria became born again. Well, from my point of view, I was glad because I, you know, she was smoking at the time, which was bad for her, her voice. She never drank too much, but she drank champagne uh, uh, at the time, and she stopped. Uh, and it was and it was good. The initial goodwill Linwood felt toward Gloria's Christian rebirth was short-lived. When she refused to party and distanced herself from the music business, Gloria drove a wedge between Linwood and herself. Well. What happened was that he continued in his lifestyle and I went on to my new lifestyle. I had gained the courage and the strength to say, um, this can't happen here anymore. It just can't happen here anymore because this is my home. This is where I live. I'm not going to get out and let partying go on. A lot of things they used to do together, she felt that was not a part of her anymore. Gloria was torn. She had finally found inner peace and self-esteem through her faith but she was in danger of losing the man she loved. I was coming down on him. I was condemning him. I no longer wanted these things that he wanted. I no longer wanted to do the things that we both had so much fun doing. A lot of outsiders were invited into our life, our lives, and uh, some of them were, was, was not so kind, you know. You don't know whether your husband loves you or not. Uh, you know, you're a mess. You are a mess. By 1988, Gloria and Linwood were spending less and less time together. She stayed at the homes of friends and family, while Linwood rarely left their apartment. And then Linwood and I separated, um, actually we separated at the end of 1988. For that whole year, from the end of 1988 until the beginning of 1990, I was shocked, you know, because the outside, it appeared that everything was fine. And, uh, when there was a separation, you know, it was, it was really shocking. But the biggest shock was Gloria's decision to abdicate her Queen of Disco throne and to record and perform only gospel music. Though personally fulfilling, her new musical direction generated little income and put a strain on the family's finances. One of the reasons why we separated was because I was considering only doing gospel music. And Linwood considered that, in my considering that, I was willing to just pull the rug out from under him. He'd given up his, his uh, pension on the police force for me to, to put his whole life in my career. He'd built his life around my career. 
Realizing the gravity of the situation, Gloria and Linwood decided to give their marriage one more chance. Although he was resistant, Linwood agreed to ask Gloria's pastor for help. I suggested counseling with my pastor. He said, I don't want anybody preaching at me. I said, look, if Pastor Bernard is not what you like, then we won't do it. But let's try it one time. Yeah, I did not come from an approach to condemn him, make him feel less than anything, uh, because he was not of the same faith or mindset or whatever. Uh, I understood where he was coming from. I was there at one time. He taught her it's not about the man or the building. It's about your spirit, believing and knowing your spirit. He helped her understand that. I don't think uh, someone as close as I am to Gloria could have done that. By 1994, with her marriage back on track, Gloria was ready for more good news. Disco was making a comeback, and Gloria's music was once again being embraced by the public. Comedian Jimmy Walker introduced her to a wildly enthusiastic crowd at the International Diamond Awards in Holland. I, I will survive Miss Gloria Gaynor! They welcomed me with open arms, and when I came back, you know, it was like, great, glad to have you back, waiting for, you know, disc jockeys, waiting for something new from you, and we've missed you, and uh, it was great. Gloria's personal and professional life were finally in harmony, yet her moment of peace and satisfaction was fleeting. In November 1995, she faced the greatest tragedy of her life. While performing in South America, Gloria was told that her sister Irma had been in a terrible accident, but it was much worse than she could imagine. I came home to find out that um, she had been in, uh, and she was not only in the hospital, but she was in coma. Gloria canceled the remainder of her tour to be by her sister's side. She soon learned that Irma's coma was not the result of an accident, but caused by a savage beating. Irma and a friend had been walking down an Elizabeth, New Jersey street in broad daylight, a block from Irma Proctor's home, when 18-year-old Rashid Wallace began hassling her friend. The sad fact is Proctor would still be alive if on that Thanksgiving day she had just walked on by. But when she saw her friend being attacked at this intersection, she intervened, and she paid for it with her life. According to court records, when Irma tried to intervene, Wallace started beating her repeatedly, kicking her in the head. For two weeks following the vicious assault, Irma lingered in a coma. Then on December 6, 1995, Gloria's little sister passed away. It was absolutely devastating for us, and Irma was a great loss. She was the youngest. I remember her being born. It was horrible, especially the way she died. It was really horrible. Took a long time, you know. Still can't get over it, you know. Gloria and her family were overcome with grief and anger. But Gloria looked to her faith for peace and understanding in her time of sorrow. First of all, I, 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 looked, I tried to look at everything that had happened. I looked at the fact that this was an 18-year-old kid. Of course, he did an adult act. But I looked at how, what kind of a life has this child had that in 18 years, he could come to the point where he could do something like that, seemingly with no remorse. So although I was angry with the situation, I was angry with what had happened, I was certainly angry that my sister was gone from my life. Gloria's faith was tested by her sister's murder. And while she struggled to understand the tragedy, Linwood was enraged. He focused his anger and energy on making sure that Irma's killer was apprehended. They found this fella hiding in an attic in East Orange or some, somewhere. Uh, he, he, he really didn't show any remorse, so the judge gave him like 33 years to life, you know. I just want to look at that guy, you know. I just want to look at him. 
I don't understand that kind of thing. Beautiful girl. She used to go everywhere with us. Gloria and her family buried Irma on December 11th, 1995. Years after her sister's tragic murder, Gloria Gaynor still has a hard time accepting the loss. She believes her faith helps her to deal with the pain. I really believe that she'd gone on to live with the Lord, that she was no longer in pain, that she was no longer having any problems, that she was in a place where she was very, very happy and very, very much at peace. Today, Gloria is often found at church trying to inspire others. She's, she's a real person. Uh, she's been there. She knows the spotlight. Uh, she's a celebrity. But she can stand uh, uh, in, in, in the choir section on a Sunday next to a person who is not known and, and be one with them and, and, and sing and minister. Gloria has even written an autobiography in hope of teaching others some of the hard lessons she has learned traveling the peaks and valleys of her life. I'm trying to share problems, difficulties of life and relationships in effort to let people know that I as an entertainer, uh, I as a celebrity have had the same problems, have gone through the same things that every other human being has had and more importantly I want to share the solutions to those problems. And with disco music back, fueled by a popular wave of 70s nostalgia, Gloria is seizing new opportunities to record and perform. Gloria has overcome her insecurity and self-image problems and now models for Ashley Stewart, a fashion chain for larger women. I tell you what, it made me know that I definitely had come a long way to be able to present my appearance to the whole of the United States. I'm, I'm just feel so happy for her because though she was never depressed to me anyway over her weight, it's something that we both have gone back and forth with over the years. And it's fantastic that she can be the spokesperson and the model at her size. Through it all, Gloria and Linwood have endured. And after more than two decades of marriage, the couple says their relationship is stronger than ever. <sighs> I don't think there is a Gloria in Linwood. I think there's a one person. We, 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 we are very close. We were committed to one another. We were committed to, to love. And that has, is what has been the glue that's held us together. She has led a life filled with success and heartache, music and madness, parties and prayers. And Gloria Gaynor has survived. For the queen of disco, her most famous song is truly the soundtrack to her life. She has survived uh, well, marital problems. Marital problems can destroy you. She survived the death of her sister and the tragedy of the murder. Well, the song is rather appropriate to many things that have happened in, in her life and, and, and our lives, and I'm sure that it's appropriate and people will take it and allow it to be appropriate to many things that happen in their lives. Now I, I've survived, I look back and I see that I've survived a lot of things that um, a lot of people don't survive. Um, sometimes some people just go into recluse, uh, some people actually take their own lives, um, some people find themselves worthless and useless, or at least think they are and live that way. And yet I, I've been able to survive all of that. I have no doubt in my mind that all of it is because of Christ in my life. I have no doubt that that is the reason why I've been able to and will continue to survive. When I was born, my mama took me and held me in the sun. Je rencontre une artiste fantastique, un charisme, un professionnalisme et une gentillesse incroyable. I love her very much. Um, we've been coming here since 1975, and every time I come, we've had a wonderful time. 
with the French people, with the French cuisine, um, members of my group, uh, although I don't take alcohol, but members of my group have enjoyed the French wines. As a matter of fact, my husband refuses to drink anything except French wine, no matter where he is. Um, and so, yeah, we've enjoyed France very, very much, and we love it here. especially Paris. We've enjoyed the Louvre. Um, of course, you have to go there 20 times before you can enjoy it all, but the few times that we've been there, it's been wonderful. Shopping on the Champs-Élysées and um, uh, visiting the Arc de Triomphe. It's been great. Oh, it's all right. Call it a pot de Gloria Gaynor. And we demand Gloria unicement sur des émissions disco. I think it's great. It's been, it's, it's surprising for me because it happened seemingly all so quickly. Um, I'm especially surprised at the fact that they are not only listening to the music, but they are, young people are wearing the clothing. I have decided that I did my time in those clothes. I would not wear bell-bottom pants and platform shoes again. But the coming back of the music, I think, is great because it's been, it was great music then and it's great music now. There are some, a few disco songs on them. They're dance music, you know, the more uh, modern, not in the same style as disco music was uh, in the 70s. Well, I love dancing. I'm enchanted with dancers, with their physical discipline that I cannot seem to, to manage myself, but um, I love dancing and I love to, to make people dance. Um, I love to cook. Uh, and I love to, to shop for gifts for people at home when I, when I go home for Christmas or when I know someone has a birthday. It's especially pleasurable for me to bring something from a foreign country that perhaps they would never have the opportunity to get for themselves. What's um, A number of things. I'm, I'm thinking of my husband and how he's always there for me. He's very supportive and very encouraging to me, uh, not only because he's my manager, but because he loves me. Um, I'm thinking about how I want to always be there for him. I'm thinking about um, my audience and how I hope to always be there for them with good music and good lyrics to encourage and uh, give them hope. I'm thinking about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is always there for me and always helping me through whatever I'm going through and pleased when I'm doing well. So I'm, I'm thinking of a number of things when I do that song, but all good things. And do you think also good things about that TV show that you've done, that great TV show, I mean, fantastic French TV show that you've done with Michelle? Well, I've never thought of myself as Queen of Disco. I've been pleased that other people have. But I leave the, the accolades and the, um, the uh, uh, good compliments for other people. To give me. I'm very honored to have been um, um, uh, taken as guest of honor for that show because there were so many of my peers there who are also great artists who have brought great music to the, to the disco scene, to the music scene, great talent. So that was a great pleasure for me um, and I really, really enjoyed it. It was really good. So do you, end up, uh, do you have a message to French people, to your French audience? My message to uh, the, my French audience is to continue um, being the great audience that they are. I will try to continue doing great music for them. And for every audience everywhere, my message is to, um, to give love and to be loved, to know God and to do what he's asking you to do because he only wants you to do what's best for you. Lors du championnat du monde de foot, un joueur nommé Candela 
à la riche idée de chanter à Will Survive dans les vestiaires. Très rapidement, après chaque victoire, on chante à Will Survive. Les téléspectateurs chantent à Will Survive. Le monde entier chante à Will Survive pour encourager les champions du monde. est la marraine des champions, reconnue par Claude Simonet, le président de la Fédération Française de Foot et le monde entier. « Ah oui, survive » est la chanson des champions. I learned how to get along